Hello, Internet. You know, I'm often astonished at the people I meet because of uh, legacy. And today I have somebody here who I've actually heard of before. Uh, Johan Elof, doctor or Domini. Johan Elof, the Domini part, you can also say reverend. And he wrote to me, and I want to invite all of you people, please, if you think you have a story, and even if you don't think you have a story, just write to me, get hold of me, and uh, soon after we will be talking and we will be telling your story, because you know what? Your story can bring out something to somebody somewhere. Somebody will relate to you. And that's what's important to the veterans as far as I'm concerned. You don't need to feel alone. Now, this man in front of me, Dr. Yuan Ilov, he was actually at Katima Melilo, and he must have been there at the same time when I was there. And of course, he was a grown man, then he was a Domini already. I was a school child, was then at Free or something. And uh, just after we left and came back to the States, to, to South Africa, a dreadful thing happened in August of 1978. There was an attack on an army base at Katima Molilo, which is in the Caprivi, and 10 of the soldiers died when the rockets, I believe, stolen orals, uh, hit them, hit, hit their barracks. And the Domini was there. He was actually on the scene. And afterwards, he also wrote a few books, which we will talk about later. So, now that I've introduced you so long, thank you, sir. We really appreciate it. It's over to you. Uh, can you tell us your story, how you ended up in the army as a Dingsburg Kapalan? Uh, that's a chaplain. And uh, the role of the chaplains and everything else you wish to speak about. Thank you for coming. Chris, someone gave me a puzzle the other day to build without an end result picture. Now you literally have to figure it out as you go. You have to find little leads and follow through on them until you get the whole full picture. And that's an amazing experience. Now today I want to thank you for the privilege to share my little piece of the border wall puzzle. A puzzle without a picture. I followed little information leads here and there, but it took me 43 years to start seeing the end result picture. I sporadically came across little pieces of information on social media since 2018. Posts with photos and emotional comments from eyewitnesses who wanted to set the record straight. I also came across documents dated uh, 2009, 13, 15, 2018 that were related to the bombardment of Katima Malilo on 23 August 78. Now these documents helped me see the bigger picture that played itself off on that night. And then I stumbled across legacy conversations a few weeks ago, actually. And I can't stop listening because the bigger picture of an important part of my life is now falling into place for me. The interesting connection among well-known places and among people I met along the way became clear. It means the world to me. I want to thank every one of you guys who shared your piece of the puzzle. And I want to commend you for your brave efforts, which brought, or at least bought, time for all of us to do the right thing. First, Chris, I will share my eyewitness accounts of experiences that's, that eventually led to 23 August 78 and its ramifications. And then I will share with you the information that I did not have, which contributed to the full picture or the full lip picture. I'm not sure I've got the whole picture yet. But anyway, so my dad bought me a little Diana pellet gun, you know, an air gun for my sixth birthday in 59. In the same year, we moved from Harbisfontein to Potterstrom. In 1960, the Saab World up Uprising happened, and 61, racial unrest, unrest was, was brewing, and people started fearing possible house invasions. Fortunately, I had my little pellet gun next to my bed, with five pellets on my <laughs> little bed table. 
just in case. So I grew up in parts of Strum, always hearing faraway military sounds of cannon fire at night and a Cessna aeroplane circling around and around. That was part of the backdrop in, in Poch. In 67, I had a gymnastics accident. I fell on my head after a somersault. And I ended up in traction in Klagstor Hospital. And a week later, I was moved to Pretoria and I ended up in a hospital ward among quadriplegics. And there I promised God I would live my life to the fullest for his glory if I recover, which I did. No more contact sports for me. So my friends and I started cycling to nearby towns on the weekends, you know, Fentus, Dorp and Paris and so on and so on. I just love being out there, you know, in the wind and the weather. It made me feel alive and I got interested in what waited behind the, in the next hill and around the next corner and so on. So one thing led to another and I turned 16 in 69 during a return bicycle trip from Potchestrom to Ilova Beach, south of Durban. And back, obviously. So, 1,600 guys, nine days, and everyone have cycled every kilometer with our own two legs. That was the deal. No cheating. Wow. That was an adventure. I rem remember the last shift took us 23 hours on the bicycles. So, in the middle of the early morning hours, we arrived in, in Paris. Anyway... Obviously, I turned 18 in 71 on a bicycle trip from Walfish Bay to Lorenzo Marx. 2,800 kilometers, 18 days, without any cheating. We fought days on end against the wind in the rain and sun and horrible gravel roads, but always in the great outdoors and in God's eternal presence. That was great. In 72, I turned 19 on a bicycle trip from Byra to Cape Town. 3,200 kilometers, 21 days, no cheating. Hard work from sunrise and off until after sunset. We slept next to the road in Mozambique and uh, wherever we could find shelter throughout Swaziland and down to Cape Town. All these places were still safe and peaceful. I turned 20 in 73 while building a mission church with fellow Potterstrom students on the banks of the Kavango River, uh, northeast of Rundu. We worked together with the locals and they taught us beautiful Kongali songs. You know, um, but Kongali is a most beautiful language, colorful, uh, you know, beautiful language. Um, it was such a peaceful environment, you know, with beautiful sunsets and we, you know, on the Mahoru, on the, on the, Paddled with the mahoras on the on the on the river and so on. It was beautiful and massive mosquitoes, massive mosquitoes. <laughs> I was stu studying to become a minister from seventy one through seventy seven in Potchefstroom, Pretoria, and then Stellenbosch. So in seventy six, well, yes, yeah, seventy six, I turned twenty three during the July holidays while doing a preaching placement at the church in Karoi, in Rhodesia, close to Kariba Dam. And I visit many farmers in the areas, um, uh, in those areas. And uh, I learned that their boys, my age and younger, were doing their military service fighting in the Zambezi Valley. And I think that's where the police guys sort of um, came into the picture as well. During my final year in 77, I turned 24, um, during an evangelism outreach to the Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada. These cycling trips and other projects um, familiarized me with many of the places and the lifestyle associated with, you know, the border war, being in Katima in the Caprivi. So I was pretty ready just to go there, just to be there, just to live there for, a, for, a, for some time. In 78, I had to do my national service, obviously. So I started doing my basic training in Fort Rekkerwechte, and we did our coin ops training at Oshibelu before I was deployed to, to 7-0, East Caprivi, until the end of my national service that year. 
So I turned 25 in Katima Mulilu as National Service Chaplain. Now, by the way, to, to set the record straight, straight with all the records that I listened to, our training was not hard. It was not difficult. It was so interesting and so much fun. But it just, you know, it helped us shape and understand where we were and how to do what and what not to do and so on and so on. So we could fit into the whole, whole thing. Uh, and we knew how to stay out of other people's business. I arrived in the East Caprivi at Mapacha Airport on, on a C, I think it's a C-160 Flossie, early in March 78. Mapacha Airport basically was an airstrip with a little corrugated iron shack as check-in point. You also had to book your flights back to the States there. Um, and you know, space on the floor, she was always scarce, so the boys put up a little notice. We can do the impossible immediately, but miracles might take a little bit longer. Because maybe you will remember that <laughs> sign there. Now, Johan Lindeke was the regional chaplain at that time, and he picked me up at this little shack. We drove north in his Land Rover to Katima, where he was stationed to do the official cleaning in a uh, clearing in admin at the sector 708 SKU for my deployment. Now, apart from him, I would be the only other chaplain in the sector for the rest of the year. It's the two of, two of us. One of, on the way uh, to Katima, he showed me a spot next to the road and flippantly just mentioned that a vehicle got ambushed there a few weeks ago. And that Commandant Poole and others were killed. We never spoke, spoke about it again. And it was business as usual on the dirt road to and from Katima. After clearing in, I went back to Mapacha, where I would be based for the rest of the year. I continuously moved around, visiting all the different units deployed at various larger and smaller bush bases between Congola River in the west and Mpalela Island in the east. Um, I used to make use of military vehicles and choppers traveling to the various bases. So I was a, I was a hitchhiker. <laughs> I made friends with a, a young army driver who regularly, re, regularly came to uh, um, Mapacha from Congola base in the West to get their food supplies at Mapacha. He was a quiet, tiny, um, not important little soldier. He just drove this Bedford with the food supplies. And I, I sort of became friends with him and I hiked to his, his, his uh, base often, sort of it became a regular thing. Um, and we normally left Mapacha only about 1500. And this meant that we, the two of us, would end up on the two strip dirt track leading through the dense bushes to the Congola base on the Zambi Zambian border. So we were such a vulnerable target for an ambush or a landmine time and again. But we did it. Once, I once crossed paths with a Unimog driving cowboy, corporal, with a smile, who also came to collect food and stuff at Mapacha. He came from Fort Dopis, and I asked for a lift to his base. Nobody got access to Dopis without special clearance, but he knew my brother, so he used, we used to teach at his old high school in Clarkstorp, so he said yes. And I was not sure we would get to Dopis in one piece that day because he drove like crazy. The Unimog just touched, touched the, the dirt road here and there. It was a crazy crazy drive and he drove with one hand all the way so at Dopis he disappeared after introducing me to a guy called Kali who was recovering from a bullet wound and he took me to the pub and he told me about um, pretty scary incidents that he uh, got involved in and he was there to you know to recover from a bullet wound by the way in the base he, all, he gave me, invited me to shoot with an AK-47, which was quite an experience. 
I slept over that night. I never saw any one of them again, ever. And for many, many years, I remembered um, these two guys sort of in my prayers. When I think of them, I sort of prayed for them wherever they were. And I didn't know whether they were still alive. I was pretty sure that Kali would, would probably, you know, he wouldn't be with us anymore. Until both of them re reappeared on Legacy Conversations. James Teitger, he was the cowboy driver. And Kali Ruas. I didn't know what Kali's name was, but I googled him and I came across Kali and so on. So, okay. So I believe there's this, you know, there's beauty in God's timing. That life taught me that wonderful, beautiful lesson. Anyway, another time I hitchhiked um, a sandbagged Unimog. They were still, you know, in, in, um, yeah, the Biffles was, were actually just arriving on the scene. A Bushman tracker was uh, the only passenger on this on this uh, Unimog. And he was lying at uh, the back of the vehicle, you know, with on his elbow on a sandbag. Uh, otherwise, he would have fell off the Unimog. And I did the same, obviously. Um, so we traveled along for at least an hour. And uh, we had a conversation the whole time about where he came from, where he was headed, um, whether he liked army life and so on and so on. The thing is, he could not speak one word Afrikaans or English. He only used Afrikaans swear words. And somehow we understood each other. <laughs> that is so <laughs> interesting. Okay, so during the rainy season, the water levels of both the Zambezi in the, in the north, I'm sorry, and the Chobi River in the south rose to such an extent that what used to be dense bush, bush floor would be drenched in water, sporting the most beautiful water lilies and pelicans and so on. I loved that. It was so beautiful. The islands to the east also got totally isolated for about six months for that reason. Now, the local missionary, you probably know him. Uh, I can't remember what his name was. Uh, did not have access to these preaching points during this, uh, you know, this half of the year. So he gave me the name of a contact person at one of his is isolated island preaching points. So I organized a comops patrol to that island. So a platoon sergeant of... I think it's still one sub, sub, uh, civil force battalion from Johannesburg. Uh, it could have been another nine, but it, those were black guys with, but uh, such such great guys to be in the uh, in the uh, in, in the bush with. But anyway, um, doing their three months uh, border duty, and they were keen to go on this patrol. So a puma uh, took us to the island on a Saturday. We established a TB among the dense bushes away from the village and moved into the village. Um, I asked for the contact person. They pointed in the direction of an old man sitting on a little carved wooden chair. You know those ones that um, his skinny old wife sat on the sand in his shade. Just imagine that picture. He's sitting on the chair. She's sitting in his shade. I told him who I was, who sent me. He told me to wait at the open space close to the village. We waited for a while. Then he arrived, followed by the village children. He sat down on his little chair, surrounded by the kids. In his hand, he held a bundle of loose pages. That was his Bible, or what was left of it. He told me to open the church. Now, I think we used five different African languages, including Afrikaans and English, to interpret my little story-style sermon that day. The soldiers had to join in, and they joined in, and they tried all the languages they knew. Uh, and so they, be they became my co-preachers that day. It was, it was great fun and interesting. So we had to repeat the process again in the proper little church the Sunday morning in the village 
And then we were told to close the church again outside the village in the early afternoon. Back at our TB, or temporary base, we prepared to, the, uh, to be uh, airlifted. We were ready. When the old man and his wife reappeared, and again, she walked behind him in his side. In his hand, he held a raw fish, and he said, thank you, we've had enough. I took the fish, I quickly cleaned it and gathered the fish, roasted it on the last hot coals of our little campfire and shared it with all this, the soldiers, this little fish. <laughs> so, one day I walked from point A to point B like you do in the army, um, in Mapacha. Um, by the way, you always look busy even if you're not busy, and you always look like you're going somewhere. <laughs> anyway, so I was on my way from point A to B. And uh, this young Tiffy in his overall approached me out of the blue, and he asked me to tell him about, about God. Just like that. So I invited him to meet me at the chaplain's room next to the pub in that evening. I shared the gospel with him. He knelt down next to me, and I laid him in a simple, simple prayer. The next day, he cornered me again, and he asked me to how to speak to God. Hey, like, how do you speak to God? He's, he's a Johannesburg little lighty. A week later, he connect, cornered me again, and he said, um, he wrote to his, his, his parents, and they, he said, I became a Christian, and they said, they wrote him back, and they said, don't bother coming home. You're not welcome anymore. So I encouraged them. We prayed for his parents. Two weeks later, he came back and he said, listen, I just came to say goodbye. We're moving back to the States, our, our, our unit. And by the way, my parents sent me another letter. They also became Christians and they can't wait to see me. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um. Anyway, in the meantime, an Elon 60 troop arrived at Katima. You know, the naughty guys. They invited me to go on patrol with them. We traveled west for a while and then turned south onto the, a two-strip bush road in the direction of the Chobe River. Um, and we had to move through an open field. I traveled on, on a buffalo transporting the infantry support section. And at some stage, I could see that the vegetation floor was damp. And a kilo further, roundabout, the leading Elon got stuck on its belly in the mud. And then the next one, and then the next one. An open target, anxious chaos amongst the, amongst the near boys. Now, the lieutenant was a bit confused and, and anxious, as I said. Didn't know what to do at, at the moment. And his sergeant, his sergeant was not making it easy for him. I looked around and I saw the dead remnants of bushes, you know, about 100 meters away. And I strongly suggested, you know, I, I got to know my place. <laughs> but I strongly suggested that he send the boys to fetch as many dry, arm thick and leg, leg long branches as they could find. We put those branches close to each other across the last Elon's tracks, you know, like railway sleepers, and on top of them, the ditching plates of the naughty cars, of all the naughty cars, just like a two strip railway bridge, you know. Um, so the last Elon slowly reversed out onto the, of the mud onto the bridge and kept moving slowly towards the end of the bridge while all of us picked up the sleepers and the ditching plates and ran around the, you know, to and sort of, you know, um, keep building the bridge in front of it until it was out of the mud. And we repeated this process for all the, all the vehicles that got stuck. Oh, well, and that, that was the end of, the, of the, the patrol, but excellent experience for the new guys. Um, 
They were to be replaced by a new troop that would arrive in Katima closer to the end of August, 78. For no particular reason, Chris, I decided to go check in with a regional chaplain, Johan, in Katima Mulilu on 22 August, 78, to deal with official business regarding my work in the area. Out of the blue, I'm telling you. So after about two hours driving in my open, I, I, they gave me an open, you know, open uh, roof Land Rover to drive around in Mapacha, but I thought uh, I'm just going, going to go with Katima now. So all by myself, and it was such a, you know, such a nice drive, you know, in the bush, it was quiet, you know, it was beautiful. I, I just enjoyed it. So I arrived in Katima. I remember I, remember I was white on the dust, you know, that, that dust road, you know, there was concrete or something mixed with it anyway. Now, Katima base basically comprised of a number of prefab um, bungalows and buildings, each surrounded by short sandbagged five-man trenches, standard dirt parade, parade ground, beautiful large trees, and walking distance from the Zambezi River. Such a peaceful atmosphere out there, but everyone minded their own bush wall business. I did the same. I stopped for a quick coffee at Johan Lenneke's house in Katima, right next to the base. It became late, and his wife invited me to stay over at their house at their house for, for the night. Now, I was used to listening to the, you know, almost comforting, uh, familiar Mapacha sounds at night, you know, semi-automatic rifle fire and mortar explosions, uh, because all the new new guys that, that, um, that, that entered the region sort of, you know, stayed there and did, uh, did the coin, coin ops uh, uh, revamping practice, so these activities were common during ongoing training exercises at night. And then there was the soothing deep bass so song of our diesel generators nearby as backdrop. And my friend, um, he, he, he used to, that was his, his task to get the diesel um, generators working. But they were, you know, um, but the Kim Katima sounds distressingly were, the stage distressingly different that evening. I woke up with one massive explosion in the middle of the night, and then another one, and another. Definitely not far away mortars. Our base was under attack. So I got into the my my jeep, my Land Rover, and I drove without lights back to the straight to the to the to the base. So one of the first projects are tiles of the on onslaught hit the prefabric. Sorry, I got to slow down first. Hit the prefabricated bungalow and exploded amongst a number of soldiers. They were young boys, not much older than, you know, 18, 17. So I arrived at the scene soon after the first explosions, before my, du before my duties, helping wherever I was needed during the overwhelming thunder of ongoing and ongoing and ongoing cannon fire and projectile explosions and ongoing and ongoing. So as I moved through the dark, smelly rubble of the bungalow where the bomb exploded, I accidentally kicked against a round object and heard it roll away on a shattered um, piece of floor. Now, I always had a little pocket um, towards it, in, you know, in my in my you know, in my pocket, in the, you know, in my in my Brown's pocket. So um, the flashlight dimly shone, um, I you know, on the on the moving object, and I saw it was a it was a hand grenade, and I knew you know <laughs> this thing is probably really unstable now, um, and it can explode any second. But the mere idea shocked me, but the overwhelming noise and stench of smoke and burnt flesh and just captured my attention while I was, um, you know, trying to find my way with this little flashlight. 
and it illuminated the torso of a young soldier still clothed in his army green uniform. You know, the army, army the, the armored cowboys used to wear. And in the pocket of his the torn uniform, I found the picture of his uh, girlfriend. Um, so I clearly remember seeing almost others, amongst others, you know, arms and legs and so on, a meter away, burnt, covered with dust. So a few minutes later, back in the chaotic little field hospital, 50 meters or what away, I heard the pleading voice of another wounded soldier boy, burnt with sand in his in and around his mouth and eyes, crying for someone to ease his pain. I saw the blood and dust covered face of another stunned sol young soldier in a torn and dusty uniform, just silently staring in front of him, while the cannon fire kept thundering and thundering and it kept on and on and on. And I knew the enemy art artillery found their target, obviously. And our position was totally compromised. And I felt for the wounded soldier boys around me, and I knew I could be next. I was horrified. <laughs> I don't know whether there's any euros in that kind of situation, but anyway, I was horrified. And I just kept doing what I needed to do. So the ongoing barrage of projectiles and explosions continued right through the night. I never knew who was firing at whom. Remember, I just turned up there. Anyway, at some stage, I could not control my emotions anymore, and I jumped into a dark trench. <laughs> just to land on top of another terrified soldier. And guess who, was, who it was? The RSM. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, we lost the 10 naughty car guys that night. And I just learned yesterday that they were to go home the next day. It was the boys um, that took me on patrol. I learned that yesterday. But anyway, let's carry on with the story. So at first light, our reaction force moved out to sweep the target in uh, enemy positions. I joined the RSM on its rounds to estimate um, the level of damage done during the night. We found more body parts in and around the trees at the location of the first explosion. A few days later, the reaction force came back with a unimog truckload of enemy, enemy bodies, dumped them on the parade ground, and the rest I'm not going to tell you. For months later, any banging noise would send me r running for cover. So when I went back to Katima, uh, to Mapacha, for them it was like a thunderstorm. They, they, it didn't affect them at all. And I acted totally crazy in there, so they didn't know what was, what was happening to me. But anyway, that's a story for another day. So, of course, now I would like to just, that's my, my um, sort of eyewitness account. Now I would like to share a few interesting pieces that fitted some of the blind spots left in my Katima puzzle for all these years. Now, these, I, I, I have long documents, but I, I'm, I just took the essence of, of the doc, these documents. I'm not going to say what, what the, 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 the sources' names and references are. It's here. I got it here. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, for the sake of this, this conversation to flow. It was only after 2018 that I stumbled upon quotes from documents that probably only came to light after 2009 and that only came to my attention after 2018. Okay, so bullet points. One, I did not realize when I naively arrived in the Caprivi how brutal, committed, and active the insurgents were all across the northern Namibian border with Angola and Zambia. Bullet number two. On the same day, 19 February 78, when Commandant Poole and, and others were ambushed on, on their way to, you know, between Katima and, and Mapacha, 
on that same date. Um, and the place was uh, popularly known as Derry on the main road between Katiman and Mapacha. On that same day, rifleman Johan Ferreira and sapper Johan van der Mest was captured by a group of approximately 47 plan uh, insurgents at their temporary base near Ilundu. Same day. Weird. Unlike van der Mest, Ferreira refused to go along with his captors and was subsequently brutally murdered, and I'm not going into the details again. Apparently, that dip, um, bullet point, apparently, uh, the deputy plan commander, Solomon Tuala, decided um, that the Battle of Kasinga on May, 4 May 78, had to be revenged. And therefore, the name of the next plan offensive would be Operation Revenge. And the target would be Katima Mulilu. This means these guys were planning for this attack, started planning just after Kasinga in May. June, July, August, they had about three months and they planned. Um, okay, next bullet point. During most of the time I spent in the Caprivi, Lan was busy planning and preparing for a devastating attack on our Katima base. And they meant it this time. Next bullet point. Lineke de Fisser, I don't know, maybe you already came across her, is a South African researcher. And in one of her documents, um, she mentions, um, and I quote, While plan was bombarding Katima Mulilu from like-named Katima Mulilu in Zambia, nine kilometers away, so there's two Katimas, the one in, in uh, the Caprivi and one in just behind Sesheki, across the river, nine kilometers away. Their artillery men were in radio communication with an observation point at Sesheki, just across the river from, from the Caprivi, from which the fire was directed. So the enemy had their, their um, um, observation post in Sesheki. And then she quote a conversation mentioned in one of her sources between these guys, the observation, observation point guys and their gunners. That's the enemy conversation. Okay. Now that rocket is over by 1,000 meters. Reduce the range. No, by 300 meters. Reduce. As soon as the target was hit, they were told to concentrate fire. That's the obvious thing, isn't it? However, things did not go quite, quite uh, according to their plan. The artillery men got conflicting information. We hit that hostel, and if we had continued, we would have hit a lot of army barracks. But someone said, you must change direction. So after that, we missed. Now this is this information is, is profound. <laughs> you know what what one one twenty two did? Okay. They were on on target. They knew it. Anyway. So it it sounds like like a bubble of warring, somehow. Okay, next bullet point. Another eyewitness account of events that provided another important piece of this puzzle was Bobby Thompson. Now, Bobby um, uh, put this on on uh, 24 August 21 on one S SSB's Bloemfontein Facebook page. I just came across that yesterday for some other reason. According to Bobby, he was a gunner. And their unit arrived in the Caprivi somewhere during May 78. They were deployed to the bush bases Gulf and Twinella, close to Katima. Now, I remember visiting 
uh, the golf base on Sundays, Sunday afternoons. We used to refer to them as the gunners of golf. Lieutenant Vesi van der Westeis was in command. And I was always impressed with the friendly professionalism of this young guy. Maybe Bobby will remember me, I don't know. As I said, Bobby was a gunner and he was sent from Gulf to Katima as part of a mortar locating crew. He therefore was in Katima at the time of the attack. Now their crew began registering enemy positions and movements along the riverbank over time, way before the attack. That was just a way of updating their maps, old and outdated maps. And they used a newly installed, they just arrived there, according to Tommy. They, they, they didn't even know why and how, but they just had to make space for the stuff. Um, so they used a newly installed new technology symbol line radar set. Now, this information was used to draw a map of the area and to continuously upgrade or register the newest updated coordinates of enemy positions as far as possible. And of what, uh, um, as possible targets, therefore. So, this is how the gunners prepare themselves. They know exactly, you know, these are the targets and they, yeah. On the night of the attack, just after the first projectile explode, explosions, <clears throat> sorry, their mortar locating crew in Katima started giving through target coordinates to the gunners at Gulf. One of the prime targets was the ferry across the river on which Plan and the Zambian army started ferrying troops, equipment and supplies across the river to the Caprivi side. Bobby thinks the guns of Gulf took out the fully loaded ferry with their second shot, effectively stopping the troops, equipment and supplies to reach the Caprivi side of the river. And he believes this was most probably the most important shot of the battle that turned the odds in our favor. Now, by the way, what I didn't say was um, when it became silent, we had to go in, in sort of rondom uh, sorry for my Afrikaans. And um, it, was, it was before light, it was still dark. And I remember... Um, sergeant major of the of the guys who were sort of taking care of the base and i just jumped in you know along with them with my <laughs> with my two magazine mag magazine r1 um he just said remember guys every shot has to count um because they were expecting um you know and a ground ground invasion it was the obvious thing after bombardment and it didn't happen. And this is why it didn't happen. Okay. Um, another bullet point. Bobby also mentioned that they used to play soccer with the armored guys at Katima. And they became friends. Now, according to him, the replacement of the army guys arrived. And on the night of the attack, all the armored guys had a braai. It was the last night of the old guys because they were going home the next day. Now Bobby's crew checked in at the braai, said goodbye to the old guys, their friends, and the armored guys carried on with their braai. Now apparently, the guys who were going home were told to move out and to bed down in the bungalows opposite to the mess, so that the new guys could took up could take up their duties in the vacated position and 115, all hell broke, broke loose, as he says. And I know he's, those are the words. According to Bobby, the first 122 millimeter red eye fired uh, on Katima landed in a milli field behind the base. Now, I was there and I saw that. I, yeah. The second rocket fell on the bungalow opposite the mess. I always, as I said, I always thought the new guys were at the explosion zone just to find out that it was the old guys. The night before they would go home, the guys who took me 
on the Inani Carpet Patrol. And that hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. So I thought I know the story, but I, yeah. According to Lineker's research, plant fired, and uh, this is also interesting, plant fired 40 122 rockets within the first 25 minutes of the attack. Okay, the, 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 we think it's, it's around about the second one they hit the target. They fired 40 in the first 25 minutes. We do not know how many other mortars and projectiles were fired by plane. Apparently, the Zambian artillery also got involved later in the fight and also fired an unknown number of mortars and projectiles. What we do know is our own artillery guys definitely fired 481 millimeter mortars, 600 140 millimeter projectiles, you know, the 5.5 five guns, um, and 350 60 millimeter mortars. All these shots were fired in 150 min 40 minutes. So those of us who on the base had at least 10 explosions per minute or one explosion every six seconds, nonstop, from 115 through 330. And we did not know who was, who was shooting, when we are going to, going to be hit again. It was just crazy. Um, so after finishing my national service, I used my danger pay to buy a windsurfer. And I signed up for a master's degree in um, practical theology in Stellenbosch, and I sailed all my memories away in Gordon's Bay during 79. But this is not the end of the story. If, we, if you have a little bit of patience with me, I'll tell you the quick rest, okay? So in 1980, I accepted the call as a permanent force chaplain at Medical Training Command in Fuertrakeruafta. Now, during that year, um, I was sent on a five week, five weeks duty to Marion Island on the South um, African icebreaker ship, the Agalas, in support of the old and new replacement weather teams. Now, that was fantastic. It's a once in a lifetime experience, and few people ever get that. And um, I, I'm so thankful for that. That was sort of like a, you know, a consolation prize after everything else. But anyway, in 81, I was sent on my uh, another five weeks duty um, on the border in the region of Ruakana, along with a civil force unit from uh, the Johannesburg area. Now the base was small. I can't remember the base's name. The, the base was small and surrounded by a, by a high dirt wall with bunkers facing in all directions, almost like a bush jail. So I received permission from the friendly OC of the company to function as rifleman six of a section of each platoon. So in this way, I could go on five day patrols with each platoon and have personal time with the boys. And I would then switch to a different platoon the next week and again to another uh, the following week and so on. And that worked really well for us. Now, during one of these foot patrols, we were trying to catch our, you know, some sleep, um, in our temporary base one night. But the guys were restless, of course. Um, I don't know what they ate, but the random farting attack broke loose. <laughs> the attack was so intense that it would have spooked any insurgent out of his boots. <laughs> I, it, was so, it was so hilarious. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's, there's a fun part of this whole ordeal as well. A week or so later, our company was sent to secure the bridge crossing the Kuneni River close to Kaluwek on 21 August 81. It's still August. Uh, and I took my place as Rifleman 6 on one of the of one of the platoons. Um, sections of a platoon. 
And we moved into Angola on foot late afternoon and secured the bridge and waited for Battle Group 10 of Operation Protea to cross the bridge. So the main road to Kaluwek led onto a beautiful but unfinished concrete bridge. The main road to Kaluwek led to here, yeah, which actually ended halfway across the, the, the river, this, this new bridge. And the fall from the, the bridge to the river was at least nine meters. So a certain death trap for any vehicle that sort of traveled that way. There was another older and narrow bridge about 500 meters to the west of the unfinished bridge. And there was uh, almost also a, a 90 degree a narrow dirt road intersection that led to the old bridge. So two of us volunteered to go back to the intersection and guide the battle group onto the safe way to the narrow bridge. We waited and waited in silence, and just before midnight, I heard the soft bass humming sound of the approaching convoy. You know, you don't hear them until they're on you, on top of you. And they don't have lights. I don't know how they saw, whether it was night vision or whatever, but they, you can't see them. And I'm not sure they could, could see me, because I was standing there in my browns in the dark with my little torch, same torch. I couldn't see a thing until the rattle appeared like a shadow about 20 meters away. Just So I waved my little pocket torch in the right direction, hoping they could see me in the pitch dark. Fortunately, they did. And a few yards from where I was standing in the middle of the dirt road in my grounds, the lead vehicle turned west and followed our direction. And this whole team um, drove past us across the bridge what an experience you know to yeah and i just prayed in my you know in my heart for the boys that were you know moving out um into action now so i went back to our positions at the bridge okay one evening early in 82 i was busy in my office back in Fuertrecker a young pilot and his fiancée knocked on my door. They were looking for the chaplain. I introduced myself, and after a short conversation, they asked me to marry them. I did what needed to be done, you know, marriage counseling, all, all of that, and I married them in Potchestrom. She actually came from Potchestrom. His pilot's Pilot friends formed a guard of honor for them. You know, it was just beautiful and so, you know, romantic. It just, it was, it, it doesn't get better. Um, yeah. So they moved to Whisprate where they started their life together. Four months later, 9 October, August 82, he died in Angola after the Puma helicopter was shot down during. Operation Mirbos. And he, along with 15 fellow soldiers, paid the highest price that day. So I knew some of his pilot friends. I knew his loved ones. I knew his wife. I shared his sorrow. I buried him as his, his army chaplain friend. I saluted him at his gravesite. I often visited his gravesite in the military graveyard in Bloemfontein. I showed my respects in the military graveyard. Um... He's one of our many war heroes who paid with their lives on that day and on many others to buy for those of us who stayed behind more time to live life to the fullest. In the meantime, I got married and I became a chaplain of the newly established survival center with Major Pierre de Priya in charge. He was also a, a Reiki, I think, of five, five Ricky. A week later, our, a week after our honeymoon, I think, I don't know what I was thinking. I volunteered to join a group of pilots in one of their first four week dynamic survival courses held in the Tassiri Game Reserve adjacent to the Kruger National Park. Um, those were, I mean, it was wild. All the wild animals, the lions, the whole deal was there. So the first week was a theoretical phase, dealing with every everything related to dynamic survival. 
that could help a pilot find his way home safely from way behind enemy lines. And the last three weeks were the real deal in the Klasiri. So we were left in the bush with only the clothes um, on our backs, nothing else. The first week, we received one wheat pick biscuit per day. There was no food in the, in the, in the bush. I mean, green marulas. That was it. I mean, you can't, you, you sort of suck on it, but that's, <laughs> it sucks, say the least. So the second week, we received half a biscuit. The third week, nothing. So, you know, between brackets, I lost in that three weeks, six kilograms. And I'm a, I'm a, a very thin kind of person. So my wife, uh, <laughs> when she saw me again, she didn't know what she was marrying. But anyway, um, yeah, so um, we worked in groups of two, walked about 25 k's per day, learned to do anti-tracking, you know, uh, hit underneath uh, branches to uh, at night to protect us, protect us from hyenas and so on. Um, by the way, one of our guys did get bitten by a, a hyena, Carl, Carl um, Volker. He, he, he got the enormous crooks later. He's a chopper pilot. But anyway, uh, the daily temperature was late in the 30s, uh, early 40s. It was, yeah, crazy. I enjoyed this adventure immensely. Um, the last week was the escape and invasion phase. They just told us in the middle of nowhere that our fictitious, what our fictitious mission was. Now, when they, they just said, you know, guys, come close. Your mission is this. And I couldn't hear what he said. And then they just said, scatter, and from now on, we're the enemy. So, Piet, and uh, maybe you know Wolf Salia and, and other guys um, that was mentioned, um, uh, what was his name? Um, they stayed, they stayed, you know, they actually moved the, 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 the course to, to another safe, safe spot and sort of in a different format. But anyway, they were all there. Um, so they gave us 10 minutes to scatter and then started hunting us down. And they used track, the tractors, uh, trackers and land rovers and, and uh, an alouette chopper to find us. And um, Graham Chisholm is not, he's not with us anymore. But Graham was the chopper pilot I learned later. Anyway, um, I somehow crossed paths with uh, Carl Fulker, you know, in this, in this thing. And then, uh, so we, in the bush, while, while we were sort of, you know, scattering. And we went through the whole rest of the ordeal together. Now, he was a good, um, um, he knew his di directions fairly well. So uh, it was good to stick to him. And he had long legs and you, <laughs> it was difficult to stay behind him. But anyway, so we slept on a number of bushes together. Um, and we tried to figure out how far the lines are actually roaring and we, whether we should get into the street or should stay <laughs> at the bottom. Anyway, it's interesting and fun. I think they caught us on the fourth day. I, I can't remember. We were so, you know, hungry and tired and fed up. And fed up is your, big, is your biggest enemy. Because then, you know, anyway. So we crossed a little footpath without, you know, getting rid of, and that's was the end of it. So they caught us, pulled out Asian bags over our heads, chucked us into a vehicle, then dropped us somewhere. I, I, I was from that moment on, I was all by myself. Um, put me in a chopper and then dropped me naked on the sand in the scorching sun and left me there. I don't know for how long until I started wishing they would come back. And then they did come back. And then they saw it made water noises. I was so thirsty, I couldn't die. Water noises and so on. And then they would walk away and didn't talk to me. And I, you know, anyway, I would have told them anything just for a bit, little bit of water. But anyway, that's how they smuggled with your head. They, it, those guys are really good. So the inter, interrogation followed and um, they wanted to know what our mission was. <laughs> 
and I really that didn't know. So first I played for time, you know, like you wait, you wait until the mission is finished, and then you sort of spill the beans when the other guys are probably, you know, safe. But anyway, and then I started saying, guys, I really don't know what the mission was. And then they said, you're a liar, and you're a Germany. <laughs> But anyway, they, they gave me a hard time. And then they pulled the bag up from, you know, and they said, okay, you've, you've passed the course. So just in closure, of course, um, at 1100, on 11 November, here in Australia, I learned to remember those who lost their lives in both World Wars, Remembrance Day. Now, I take that opportunity to remember those who paid the highest price during the wars, conflicts, and peacekeeping operations in South Africa. And I softly recite the phrase, lest we forget. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. So, of course, I told you at the beginning that someone gave me a puzzle to build without an end result picture. For many years, I tried to figure out my end result picture. And I think, yeah, I had to find little leads and follow through on them until I got pretty much close to the full picture, I hope. And I just can say it, it was an amazing experience. There's beauty in God's timing. When it's God's time, we have to do the right thing. Now, we used to think God is on, on our side, but God doesn't choose sides. He invites us to his side. And he meets all of us in no man's land where the cross of Jesus used to stand. And that's the full story. Thanks. I must tell you, we've learned a lot from you here today, you all. And I thank you for that. And I'm making notes here. And I, I just want to tell a story quickly. And if there's some noise coming from the outside, please forgive me. We are building Rebecca's kitchen here below. Here they go. Um, I hope it's not too disturbing to you. But some years ago, I worked with some guys. And they told me a story, and they said there was a combined training operation between MI5 and MI6. Now, MI5 is like the guys who catch the spies, like the FBI. MI6 are the James Bond. Why, like uh, the CIA? They're not really that good, to be honest. None of them are that good. But anyway, to make a long story short, the new MI6 recruits, which was in the late 1980s, decided... They would be captured by MI5 recruits and then be interrogated. It would be a good real-life experience. So being MI6 or 6, as we call them, they booked into a hotel and they started drinking. And uh, by Monday morning, the 6 liaison officer to 5 says to his mate, now, we drank the boy empty twice. The landlord wants to chuck us out. We're you guys. And 5 says, but... We captured you on Saturday evening already. And then it came out, they, 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 they captured the wrong guys. They, they hit the wrong hotel, wrong floor, wrong room, and got hold of these few guys who are just sitting there doing, they know nothing, they're not part of this exercise. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then it came out, the guys were captured by the grace of God, were wanted by some mafia connections in London for some ice they were doing and running with the money. And they thought that the uh, MI5 guys were from these guys. And so they just put them on a boat there across the cross <laughs> and told them, if you ever come back, we're going to, it's going to be really bad for you. But they were very impressed, these MI5 guys. They said that um, these new recruits wouldn't break. They just wouldn't confess because now we know they couldn't. It's the same as you. That's why I'm laughing so much here in the background. <laughs> but yeah, um, you see, the, the horrible thing is, sorry that I interrupt you. Um, I learned you've got to know what the mission is, otherwise you're in bigger trouble. 
number one. And number two, don't get caught. Yeah, don't get caught because once they caught you, they'll catch you, they will do things to you. I mean, this is Africa. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say to the listener here that um, we have a special going on at Free to Battalion at the moment. We, we're making a whole series of videos, very high quality with, with people who is really the legends talking about different operations. And one of the ones they're talking about and they're setting up right now will probably be recorded by our friend Andrew Whitaker is uh, Mebos, Ops Mebos. So there's coming, that's going to come out uh, a lot of stories on the inside. And also want to say to these people who perhaps doesn't know South African military history, the attack on Kasinga was the largest, probably to, to this very day, paratrooper operation since the Second World War in Africa. Uh, more than one, I think two battalions of paratroopers descended on this armed camp. It was really not a refugee camp. And uh, one got lost, one of the paratroopers. Uh, I think we're bringing his body home this year, I'm hoping. We had a program on legacy about it. I believe he landed in the river. There were problems. There were, there were problems with the way they worked out. General McGill Alexander also spoke about it. The paratrooper general, he did his PhD on it. Uh, fantastic story what happened there. So everything just fits together. But now I want to take you back, if you don't mind, you on to 1969. That is when you were cycling with your mates right across Africa almost. Now I'm curious. Did that contraption of yours, that bicycle, did it even have gears? You know, these, these handles that were like this. I started off with that in Wildfish Bay. In Port Elizabeth, I got, got myself drop handles. Um, but but uh, the frame was still heavy. Um, it was a semi-sport bike. Uh, it just meant it, it was um, painted, you know, sporty like but it, it was still you know and um it was still you know the, the medium size uh, tires we had to work hard no i can i can just imagine because i recall my time in the police college you could choose what sport you want to take and i'm sure i told the story before uh but the whole bunch of us just decided they're gonna say cycling is their sport and then they would, of course, cycle down outside the gates of a police college and then stop at the closest cafe, which was called Quisco Karot, for obvious reasons. But you have the nicest Papa Joe pies there, I can tell you, that were Coke. And the things we ate in those days were just dreadful. Police actually gave us very good food, I have to say that. But anyway, so they arrived there, and this went on for about two, three times. And then... Sadly, a, a young police sergeant arrived who was a Springbok cyclist. And he arrived there with his Indian bike, and he took them on a run all the way right around Pretoria West. They say they, they were almost in Cape Town before he turned back, but you know, we were just talking. But it was more than 80 kilos, and some of them were on their uh, chopper bikes. I don't know. Uh, yeah. These chopper, they're really not designed to, to, to drive that far. And I yeah. believe the next Saturday, most of them were saying how they play for Wednesday. They were playing rugby. They were not cyclists anymore. I think he, yeah, I don't know, he broke him there. But, but on a serious note, do you think a chaplain is a trusted person by the young uh, soldiers? Uh, would, would, would they tell you things which they would not tell their parents or perhaps their, uh, uh, their comrades, their, their, their mockers, or, or even their commanding officer? Um, I can't speak for other chaplains in general. It's it's difficult, but um, you got to build a sort of a little bit of rapport. You got to be you, you got to turn up in someone's life. So why why the platoon? You know the going on on patrol thing worked for me was you know you go into when you rest you go into a sort of a you know roundabout rondom um, verdediging, um, and then I would sit you know with with one guy. You know, sit next to the tree with, with him and, and just say, I, you know, just chat. And I remember this this one guy 
he was um he his head was not there i said what's wrong what was going on and he said um well i my my girlfriend is pregnant and um uh, I learned that that uh, she wants to get an abortion, and and um, I don't want her to get an abortion. I want I, I want us to have the child, and I can't communicate with her, and I'm losing my child here. So I, we could have that conversation. I mean, who, who do you talk to about that? It can make a difference. So I drove all the way to Rakana and contacted the the um, connections and delivered the message and. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what would have happened after that, but um, yeah, um, you can if you if you're there, but you got to turn up somehow. I think, and, that's and the, the other thing that I sorry, the other thing that I learned was, um, you, you you needn't as a chaplain, you needn't be or try to be as good as they in on, in in their field in their business. You you should not c compete with a soldier. Run faster or shoot better or or be tougher or anything. Um, that's the most. I think it's the it's the worst thing that you can do. You just gotta help them understand that you can actually be there and it's not gonna be in their way. We're sort of in the same boat, mate. We we, we gotta we gotta survive on planet Earth. Yeah, <laughs> we gotta do it together. Now that you're talking about surviving, you said when you jumped there on top of a RSM in the trench during the attack on Katima Malilo, <laughs> you had an R1 rifle with you. That's a SLR for the guys from the Brits, 7.62. Fantastic feeling, yes. but, but it was too long for <clears throat> yes. walk in my eyes. Yes. But anyway, yes. you had two magazines. Now, obviously, as a soldier, you are trying to use these things, even though you're a chaplain. Yeah. But would you normally be, be armed? Is, is it standard policy in the SADF for a chaplain to be armed? Oh, they would issue it you with, with a with a pistol. Um, and then what you what you knew and what they actually said was, um, don't try to shoot any any anyone with this thing. Just throw him with a thing. And uh, but I mean, I I had to move all around, and I didn't know when I'm gonna be where. And I don't didn't want to be in the way, so I had to make my contribution. So I always carried the R1 with me. I recall that when we were. And yeah, by, by the way, um, you know, in a bush base, when when you you uh, you use a go kart, you gotta put the the, the toilet paper somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember that now. I also remember being in serious trouble with the police chaplains because I made my men uh, put condoms over the barrels of their rifles. And yeah. I mean rifles, but I mean something yeah. else for the yeah. dirty fingers. Yeah. But to keep the dust out. And they, yeah. were, they were a little bit pretty. I mean, uh, I, I would say South Africa in those days were very, uh, oh, what's the word, very conservative. Can I, can I use that word? Very, very conservative. Yeah. Yeah, Actual yeah. Fact. Yeah, yeah. Getting a girl into trouble, so to speak, was not yeah. uh, the in thing. Yeah, it was severely frowned yeah. upon, yeah. and, and marriage was yeah. virtually uh, insured afterwards, even as like a shotgun marriage. Is that good or bad, actually? Do um, you think it's a good thing to almost force people through society to get married just because they are having a child together? I'll give you another answer. Um if a girl of 16 gets pregnant and she wants a baby and she get, she's forced to um, give the baby away, I think it's one of the most horrible things you can do to a person, both to the baby and to that mother. Um, it's better to support that, that young mother and, and uh, help her to, you know, um, because, he, okay, for me, they, they might be not that ready emotionally. But you know, once your baby is born, um, you grow up very fast. But anyway, so so I know of many girls whose lives were ruined because they were forced to get to get uh, abortions or to give their bo babies away. Um, at the same time, um, I think it, it, it's, it was really, Awkward, and um, 
to sort of look down upon a family if, if uh, you know, this, this kind of thing happens in the family. And it happened all the time. Uh, we need each other support more than when we're in trouble than, than it's, it's condemnation. You know, we, we're not here to judge. We're just here to be witnesses <laughs> as Christians. No, you're quite right. You're quite right. But, but you know, the story didn't end here. And we're going to have another episode on your book and work afterwards as well. But I need to touch it a little bit. I, I, told, I tell a story in one of my books in my own autobiography. But I said one day I was, by this time, five, five years in the police. We knew nothing else. And we were sitting there and we were watching... Tom and Jerry. In those days, you could rent a video machine, a video cassette recorder. Yeah. Yeah. I would rent it with a few videos. There might be yeah. some lines on the screen, but none, nevertheless. And yeah. You sort of get this Tom and Jerry type of comics for free with it. And so, so, so we did that. And we sat there, a whole bunch of us. And these were good people. Good, honorable people. And, and they sat looking at it and they were laughing and I realized their eyes were dead. It, it was for me an utterly shocking thing. I looked at them and I thought, you people are dead already, you just don't get it. And the next day, when I went to work, of course, you had to be clean shaven, you don't look like this. And then uh, I realized my own eyes were dead. I've seen too much, done too much, I've changed. My question to you now as a therapist is, a lot of us listening here know there's something wrong with us. We, we, we can't always put the finger on it, but we do know. I mean, there's a lot of explosions happening in Phuket at night. That's how they bury people. They, they make these explosions, things like that. Every time that happens, I, I shake. And it is really hard for me not to dive to cover and not even to dive to cover. That will be fine if I do that. But I would probably grab Rebecca and throw her onto cover as well while shocking. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, what's wrong with us? Can we be helped? Um, it's actually a, 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 a conversation for another day, but I, I'll give you a short answer. Um, the common denominator of trauma and most other um, uh, um, conditions and disorders is chronic stress. Uh, it, uh, there's many people who sort of uh, put a question behind the word chronic stress. What the heck is chronic stress? So um, you got to figure out what it is because it, it is something. But that is the that is the common denominator. And if you can deal with that, you can deal with all these other things. Um, and it's in, and it's it's so sort of uh, kind of easy. It's not rocket science to deal with chronic stress because it's a lifestyle thing. Um, it's a way of of uh, communicate thing. It's a way of of um, of um, looking at, at at life. It is a way of of um, um, developing a vision of the future that is 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 um, meaningful, and so on. Um, yes, it can be done. And actually, it can be fun to sort of work your way out of the mud, like those, you know, those uh, naughty guys that I spoke about. But they do need to do something because of a naughty cause, the Yolanda. You did do something, but they didn't come out of there by themselves. You went and put the branches and then those uh, thingies on top of them. My advice would be. Um, if you build the meaning, if you know, if you give meaning to what you what you remember, you know, and what you remember is not the truth. It's not built on the real stuff that really happened. It maybe you you got it wrong, and you build the meaning, the meaningful um, um, story around something that did not really happen. You're in big trouble. That's why it's so important to get the real narrative, the real account of events, um, as clear as possible, because then it affects the way you think about it. And then the way you think about it becomes more meaningful. 
And you can actually live with that story, even if it's a negative story. You can learn from it and carry on. Otherwise, it, it, it becomes a sort of a, um, a catch-22 cycle. You don't get out of that, that cycle of, of um, lies that you live with and live by. But you can break the cycle just by telling your story. And this is why, why um, this means so much to me. I, you know, I le this is part of the experience of what I wrote in my book of how it is supposed to happen. How you, how you get heal healing from getting to the bottom of things, even though it hurts. And by the way, there's nothing wrong to, with, with hurting if it's appropriate. But if it's not appropriate, then there's, there's something wrong. And then it's not the, the emotion that is wrong. It is the, the something that is not true that, you, that makes you hurt. It, does that make, you know, either it's a real bomb or it's a, a, um, a fake, you know, a thunder, thunder, a donor bus. What is, what is that in English? The one that just makes the sound. You know, it's just shocking. It's just a shocking sound. Um, it's not. It's not the same thing. The one sort of just scares you. The other one really is a scaring thing. You got to be scared for the for the other one. So, um, if you feel traumatized because of it, the sound of something that is like a you know uh, um, a paper flame, you you you're scared about nothing, and that is inappropriate. And that is. Many people live with that kind of pain and fear and, and so on that's based on lies. So come, get the truth out there. This is why, why um, these conversations, this, this is why I can't stop listening because there's so many pieces of the puzzle that comes together. You know? You know, many people say that to me. A lot of the troopies who national servicemen say to me, they haven't realized uh, they couldn't understand the Stalner mark, the permanent force people, until they started listening on legacy and they could understand how these guys were thinking and, yeah. and what they were trying to do. Because, you know, during training, people don't really explain. It's a matter of seeing it by boom, by blarky. But of course, you can't actually do because that is damaging of state property. You can be arrested for that. Um, I said that once to instructor. It didn't work well out for me at all. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this guy was a bit funny. I mean, he, you know, we always had to run around to this guy. And I once said to him, I said, uh, Warren, which is what we call the sergeant major in the place, my warrant officer. I said, sir, are, are you a believer? He said, yes. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, Spreek 28 vers 1. Slechts die goddelose sal haar koop sonder om gejaag te word. <laughs> and I say to you, he was not all that impressed. Um, I was running in front of his land cruiser for several miles, uh, praying to God that he doesn't drive over me, because of, whenever you slack down, he just comes closer and closer. But there were all these things. Uh, one thing which you said to me stood out here, and I want to ask you about that. How is it possible that the chaplain's room is right next to the pop in Katima Bolilo? That was that plan to <laughs> what the hell? I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, the guys were having a massive party. You know what they did? They could, I think, they were allowed to buy one beer per night. So they would put together all their all their their beers. Um and so one guy gets all the beers that night, and they so the the next guy and so on and <laughs> but anyway, they were really going on that night. And we were kneeling down to pray right next to that. And I thought, well, this is this is reality. This is real. This is the real deal. So I'm not scared to be the, you know, do the real thing. And um, I think you can't be a Christian without being, um, have integrity. If you are one, then you got to be one. End of the story. There's no, it's unfortunately a black and white thing. Um, there's no, no middle ground here. So, uh, and, and it's, yeah, it's not a, it's not a, yeah, we, that's, well, that's a story for another day as well. 
Um, but anyway, you are or you aren't. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's close to the pub. Or you know, it's the only place where you can meet up um, in, in any bush base is the pub. So where do you go as a chaplain? You go to the pub, but I don't drink. So I was always there having a Coke, and they all always wanted to know what's in your Coke. Can I make sure there's something in your Coke? And I said, no, it's, I'm all right. But then they would come and, you know, so after beer two or three, they come and they tell me their whole story. <laughs> so that was the best uh, counseling place. It's right there at the, in the pub amongst everything. <laughs> so that's what, what I loved about being being a chaplain. I've got a strict frog for you. I've got a trick question. Tell me, did your wife forgive you after your... Uh went on that um, bush survival thing, leaving her all alone during honeymoon. And I, I didn't realize how scared she was to be alone at home, for, for, you know, foreign home and, and foreign place and everything. I didn't realize. I was a, I was a, an idiot. I'm still an idiot. But anyway, She's still with me, and and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman. I'm, I'm I just can't. Yeah, she's she's just the best. Um, she never complained, but um, when I realized what I did to her, I've I've really felt ashamed. The problem is, I would have done it again. I'm laughing so much here, yeah, I couldn't even press the mute button on button it. But 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 seriously now, do you have any uh, message for your fellow veterans who's listening here who perhaps haven't seen you in many years or only met you now? Do you have any message for me? Um I just wanna say guys, uh, um thank you for what you've done. Um, this whole machine to to spare a life, to save a life, to to protect a community. Um, you know, there's the guy who, who cooks the food. You know, one of those guys spoke on your on your channel, and and so on and so on. And this is you know this Bobby guy, uh, this uh, radar guy, and and so on and so on. They. They are the heroes in many, many instances, and they don't realize it, and nobody's going to give them a medal. You know, I didn't even get my, my uh, pro, 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 pro Patria medal ever. I've been there, but I never got a medal because nobody thought they don't, they don't realize. I was never part of a unit. I was just the, the last soul amongst the lot. But anyway, so they don't realize of what importance they've they've been. And I want to say to them, um, go look in the picture and, you know, say, good job, mate. You did it. And you're a survivor. And uh, you can actually thrive and get rid of the stuff. You know, there's so much debris that we carry around in our, in our heads, uh, debris memories. Um, unless we tell the story, then those debris becomes puzzle pieces and you can actually work with it and you can form it into beautiful statues that you can actually um, uh, appreciate but don't sit with the debris it hurts you when 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 uh, you least ex expect it you know um, there's a song about the first world war about no man's land this is why yeah I, I can't remember which, which, which um, if you follow it, you'll find it on, on YouTube. It's, and someone just sent me that link. And um, sort of on, 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 on uh, WhatsApp, and I clicked on the link, and there was the song. I was just in a good mood and everything, and this song hit me in a place that I didn't know exist. I had to go away and cry somewhere. I was a, I'm, an, I'm an old man. <laughs> I started crying about this because I it, it just took me right back to that that 
you know, that guy in, in whatever that I spoke about today. And, and um, you got to talk about it so you can get over these things. Talk about it. I think that's you can all do it. it. Talk about it. You can Come do it. Legacy. Come and tell us your story. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, you'll be surprised. We, we we really like listening to you. You know, the statistics, I keep on saying to people, the statistics tells me that people are interested. They want to hear. There's no way in the world we can have 100,000 views a month for 50,000 hours, which is five years of views al a month, every month. With all people wanting to know the story, you know, when we came back, nobody cared. <clears throat> really, no one would even ask you anything about it. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, and so you kept quiet. And then later, yes, uh, people laughed at you. And of course, you were on the wrong side and blah, blah, blah. And then life went on and on. Those days are over. I think we earned the gray hair now. We were worms ourselves. And so I invite everybody, uh, guys, don't sit alone in your room. I keep on saying it, but that's what all the chaplains and all the generals and all the psychologists, everybody, was the wise people of, of legacy, they all say the same thing to me. Don't corner yourself off. Don't go and sit alone in your room and, and think too much. Uh, go to your comrades. Go to a place where, where people like you are. Yeah. You know, the shell holes, the moths, the associations, go back to them. That's where you belong. Come back to us. And uh, that's where you'll be happy. And so I say to all of you here yeah, and to you, you want thank you. You're definitely going to come back because I know this is not the entire story. I know that as a therapist, there's a lot of things you can tell us, and I would hope you would. And of course, your book as well. I don't know if it's still available. Uh, for people to read, if they can try and read it, I know it's um, uh, some books are very difficult to read, especially if a PhD wrote it. But there might be people here. Yeah, so, so tell us quickly about your book before I say to everybody, God bless and goodbye. Um, I, I'll just show you the picture. Moving on from chronic stress to sustainable resilience, and um. It is, it is um, about narrative care. Care for your narrative and your narrative will take care of you. This is sort of the, um, you can overcome all of this. Um, so I worked with neurobiological principles and biblical principles and they fit together like, you know, hand in a glove. Um, it re I think it's really interesting and I used many of these kind of stories and so on, you know, um, case studies from my own life to to explain why I say this um, and why these conclusions are sort of uh, effective. Now it's worked for me. So, so um, this is actually part of this this whole process, narrative care. Um, now the book is available on on. Um, Amazon and all of those places. Um, you just go for Moving On by Johan M.B. Ilov. Um, Johan M.B. Ilov. And uh, you'll probably find it there. Google, just Google it. Yeah, just Google it. I'll put the links in here. We really don't mind doing that. And we will no. get you back to speak about the book and the book alone. And a little bit of other things as well, if you don't mind. And then I'll say to all of you, we've been speaking here to the doctor, Domini, Johan, great man, actually, almost two hours. And so uh, thank you to all of you, and God bless you. I really mean that when I say it. Bless all of you, spread the word, and if you have a story, come and tell us. Thank you, guys. God bless. Thank you, Chris.